Serie A fans, benvenuti. Welcome to the Total Football Analysis Serie A podcast. I am Daniele Proc, speaking to you from Italy, and I'm joined by Chris Manfor, the EPL podcast host and a professor of innovation at the University of Chapel Hill in North Carolina. He is right now in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So, Chris, how are things there where you are? Well, things are as good as considering the circumstances. I think there's some uh, optimism. Uh, of course, uh, COVID is the uh, the dominant issue here. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a, a college showcase that my son played in in South Carolina. And uh, I think the South Carolina view of how to manage COVID is different than the North Carolina view. So, how so? Uh, um, I just, you know, I saw a lot of people without masks uh, and you can mm-hmm. kind of see why there are parts of the U.S. where uh, the growth rates are extraordinary. A um, little unfortunate, um, you know, I, I, so that part's not great, but the positive part is is the first vaccine deliveries are starting to uh, to happen. So really pleased about that. But let's talk about what's going on with you in Italy. I think you have some news to report. Yeah, well, first, we are wearing masks. They're uh, compulsory, so uh, we are taking it seriously. Um, and then, yes, I have uh, signed for a team in Italy for, uh, for the next six months until the end of the 2020-21 season. The name of the club is Caldero Terme, uh, playing in Serie D, uh, fourth division here in Italy. And I'm like, very excited, super hyped to start this new adventure. Um, and yeah, the club is located near Verona, um, if you guys uh, have nothing to do on, uh, uh, what is it, uh, morning in the, in the U.S. around 8.30 a.m., you can follow, follow our games. Uh, it's a very exciting league, one that I used to play before I, I left the first time for the U.S. And the um, first game that I'll be able to play will be this, this weekend, Chris, this Sunday. I think that's... Amazing. Uh, we all know that if you stayed in the U.S., you'd be playing pickup uh, probably with uh, with guys like me. But uh, you're actually <laughs> playing pro ball in Italy. Um, so how how is the how is the training different there versus here? Well, uh, the sessions are not too different. I will say that the the players, the way the players interpret the game, is a little um, more uh, is a little diverse here in that. You have players that uh, they grow up with a different sense of the game. I'm talking about tactically, especially, um, but also technically, uh, versus uh, in the U.S. You have uh, perhaps a, a higher uh, work rate or a higher uh, mentality around work rate versus here. Uh, the focus is much more on uh, how do you position yourself as a team on the field and how do we... Uh, stay organized? How do we work together? Uh, how am I supposed to move according to my teammates? Maybe that's the biggest difference, but eh, I just started. Uh, I hadn't played Italian football for, what is it now, four and a half years. So I'm excited to re-explore this world and I'll let you know more as the, as the weeks go by. I'm excited to learn more about it. I'm going to go ahead and book my live stream at 8.30 uh, on Saturday and Sunday mornings before the Premier League and City A matches. So uh, really, uh, congratulations on that, Daniele. Good Appreciate stuff. Appreciate that, Chris. And I, I'll make sure to ring you at 8 a.m. Uh, uh, Eastern time to wake <laughs> you up in case you were thinking of slipping in on Sunday. <laughs> that sounds great. That sounds great. Chris, today's episode will be a little different in that uh, we'll have a special guest, Matt Santangelo, who will help us break down the dynamics of this uh, AC Milan that simply continues to impress, even though they did tie this past weekend. We'll talk about, uh, we'll talk more about that, and we'll also talk more about the rivals of the Italian clubs in the round of 16 of Champions League. But first, let's take a, take a quick look of what happened over the weekend with Inter rolling over uh, Cagliari 3-1. I say rolling for the score, but Cagliari did uh, manage to take uh, the lead earlier. And then uh, the goals of Nicola Varela, uh, Romano Lukaku and Danilo D'Ambrosio were able to put Inter past uh, this initial scare uh, that Cagliari posed on, on Inter. Juventus had a very familiar name uh, on the score sheet. Again, Cristiano Ronaldo scored two in uh, Juventus' win over Genoa 3-1. Andrea Piello, the manager, will be happy to uh, see Paolo Dybala uh, going back to scoring habits. Um, 
speaking of Juventus, Chris, uh, Juventus have the best defense in the league with nine. Uh, they're currently sitting fourth at 23 points. You know who else has the best defense in the league? Yes, you do know because you're following this team very quickly. Is Verona with nine goals as well. What happened over the weekend with Verona upsetting Lazio away 2-1? to one? What fascinate, fascinates you about that game, Chris? Well, I, I think the key to upsets in Serie A is have an own goal or a PK or a bad back pass. Uh, and in both of those cases, you know, Verona, uh, they uh, really sat back. You know, they only had 38% possession while Lazio had 62%. And they were able to capitalize on some missteps. And uh, Lazio had plenty of scoring opportunities. Uh, in fact, they had a higher XG, 1.36 versus mm. Verona, which is 0.37. And Lazio was reining it in. They had 12 shots on goal, only four on target. And Verona had five shots in total and three on target. So it was one of those instances where Verona's tough, tough defensive out. Lazio was a little bit unlucky. And Verona was able to capitalize on those mistakes. Yeah, that's a little bit unlucky. But as you said, there was uh, an own goal by, by Manuel Lazzari on a shot from a Verona player. A little unlucky, yes, because on goals usually are unlucky. I don't know if we could have done better in clearing, um, talking about Lazari, in clearing that ball. Uh, but then the second goal is unforgivable, a back pass that got intercepted by um, Verona player uh, Adrian Tamese with a touch. Tamese just uh, dribbled Reina, who was trying to come, who came out of his line to try to intercept or at least to get first to that ball. And, uh, and they just put in the the goal for Verona. Uh, now Verona are, are doing very well in the league, sitting at uh, 19 points, seventh. So very well, well done for uh, uh, Juric's men. Chris, another interesting um, game was Napoli, uh, Sampdoria, the Partenopei won two to one at the Stadio. Diego Armando Maradona just who that just got renamed after the the Argentine um, star. Before we aired, you talked about how Napoli, who have the, uh, the sh- one of the shortest uh, attacks in the league, they scored two goals on headers. It is true that this time Gattuso played with Andrea Petagna on top, the center forward that is 6'2", 1.9 um, meters. But that was an interesting, uh, an interesting aspect of a team that usually has like 5'7", five, 5'6", five, uh, attacking players. Yeah. I mean, this was a fascinating game to watch. You just love the energy that, that Napoli is, uh, is bringing. And Samp, as you know, is quite, quite frankly struggled, um, you know, but for all the effort that Napoli put into it, they had 16 shots in total of which six were on target. Samp only had six shots, only two of which were on target, but the XGs were below one for Napoli and 0.6 for Samp. So, not a lot of tremendous um, uh, goal creation, uh, but hey, uh, uh, you end up, uh, you know, you, you play the balls that, that, that you get. So uh, that's really what happened in this situation. Napoli is starting to look like the real deal, right? I mean, they've mm-hmm. been threatening for a bit, but they're in third place um, just behind Inter. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, in the coming weeks. You're right. Napoli are third with uh, uh, eight wins and three losses, one of which was the famous one that came by forfeit. What was impressive about Napoli is that how um, is the growth of Hirvin Lozano, the Mexican player, the, the winger, he keeps impressing. He already has six goals this year. Uh, an incredible improvement from, uh, from last year performances. And Napoli also have the, the assist leader in Serie A, Mertens. He has six in the league, six assists. And even this past weekend, he, he painted that kind of left-footed cross for, for the head of Lozano, who is definitely not a tall, uh, a tall attacking player. And, uh, but the ball was so precise. He was always obviously well-positioned uh, to head that in. But the ball by Mertens was spectacular. And he had to just head the ball... Uh, onto the ground and it went past the the Sampdoria keeper. 
Chris, Milan tied against Parma on, uh, on Sunday night, 2-2 after being down 2-0. Uh, Milan slowed down a little, but they still managed to keep the first position in the league with 27 points, three above Inter. Before we, um, we're going to uh, use the help of Matt Santangelo to break down that game and all things AC Milan, you, you talked about how unlucky um, you, you mentioned how lucky was, was Milan in that game. They hit the woodwork four times, huh? Yeah, I mean, uh, let's face it. It, it. it looked, you don't need the stats to show you this. The eye, the eye will tell you, you know, it's 64% possession. Uh, Milan had 24 shots, but only six were on target. Parma had five shots, of which three were on target. Mm. So Milan had a 1.63 XG and Parma had a 0.64. But the truth is the game ended at 2-2, right? So uh, that's those instances where Milan was pretty unlucky in these games, particularly when you're playing against a team like Parma, you can't lose those games. Uh, You want to win them, but if you can't win them, you don't want to lose them. Uh, and you take the point and you keep going, right? So um, Milan was content, w- is able to continue to add points at the top of the table while uh, Inter and Napoli are just cruising away with, with their wins and trying to close the gap. You said it right. It was, it was uh, a great single from Milan to not lose that game so yeah. that they continue this, their streak of positive results. They haven't lost in the league since the lockdown, since... Uh, games resumed in June. Uh, the only loss they had was in, in Europa League against Lille. Um, but besides that, they haven't lost a single game, all wins or ties for um, Stefano Pioli's man. But it's time to uh, introduce, to, uh, to talk with Matt Santangelo to help us see what are Milan's strengths, weaknesses, what's going on with the management. Is there going to be an Ibrahimovic replacement? That's all after the break. Welcome back, Serie A fans. Like promised, it is time to introduce Matt Santangelo, a New Jersey native, co-founder, co-host of the State of Play podcast, which covers Europe's top five leagues and the MLS, and was awarded the 2020 goal-winning football podcast from the Football Content Awards. Congrats for that, Matt. But his work does not stop here. Matt is the co-creator of the Milan Brothers, a fantastic website for Milan-related news, and Matt's work also featured on major sports publications like The Guardian and These Football Times. Welcome on the show, Matt. Come stai? Hey, it's a pleasure to be on with you guys. Thanks for having me. And of course, to talk about, you know, Serie A, which is my huge passion of mine. So um, I'm definitely looking forward to this. So once again, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Why uh, don't we just begin? I'm curious, Matt, how did you in the first place get involved uh, with, with talking about calcio, football, soccer, whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it? I actually got involved. Um, my story is probably a little bit different than many of the other guests you maybe have had on or just a lot of the fans of Calcio in general uh, who kind of acquire their love for a certain club or the league itself at a very young age from a family member. For me, it was kind of something I had to search for, uh, looking for different interests as far as sports go. You know, as you mentioned, being on the East Coast, New Jersey, and the United States, um, I'm so exposed to, you know, baseball, basketball, American football that you kind of forget about what else is out there. And of course, you know, outside of the U.S., there's no more popular sport than soccer, football in general. So that's where I started branching out. I kind of use my Sicilian roots and Polish roots to kind of merge on to see what's going on in those specific countries as far as uh, football is concerned. And yeah, I just kind of grew to love uh, Calcio in general, kind of brushed up on history. I think that's a really important thing for a lot of people to um, learn is it's, it's one thing to have it, a, you know, an obsession or fandom for a certain club. But I think knowing the roots, knowing what makes them who they are um, is, is very key and very important. And that's kind of where I started, you know, somewhere around middle school, I would probably say is where I grew to love Milan, start really focusing on them and covering them extensively, I would say in high school. And then from then on, I just, the rest is history, right? Podcasting, writing, content creation, just general coverage of them. And it's, pretty much consumed my life that's all I really talk about you can back you can see the Milan flag over my bed so 
Yeah, and because uh, you're so close to the AC Milan world, I look forward to really you breaking down uh, this young team, the youngest team by average age in uh, Europe's top five leagues, currently sitting first in the league with 27 points, undefeated. So, Matt, let's start with a general question. Why don't you point to, uh, let's say, three strengths and maybe one, two weaknesses of this AC Milan team? Sure. Well, I think the first strength, I'm going to go the top one here. And I think it's the, um, it's the strength and unity character buildup mm-hmm. of this squad. And I think, you know, a lot of times for when we look at it, what makes a squad good and why are they so successful or why are they winning trophies? I think it's only natural for them, for us to look towards the players, right? The, the, those who are on the field carrying out the duties and making everything happen. But I think there's something about this Milan squad as far as that element, right? That, that not tangible element of, of what makes them good and what makes them successful, like we're seeing here early on in the season. And really since 2020 began and Ibrahimovic arrived, mm-hmm. there's obviously clubs you can point to around Italy, Europe, that probably have, you know, per player by player, a stronger side. But I think what makes this team so unique and special is that they have that coach that believes in, is able to instill that confidence in them. But the character of the character makeup of this team is really profound from what I'm seeing in the sense that the sum of their parts is really strong. They'll be able to play above their, uh, perhaps their potential um, and effectively find ways to dig out results and get results otherwise where they're maybe not, you know, deserving of them. And I think in previous years, you know, Milan have gone for, you know, the Fernando Torres is of the world and some of these other guys and it looks good. It, you know, it's a big name and it's this and that, what have you but they never for whatever reason seem to quite fit. And I think when you look at this squad overall and the makeup of it, I think that element of it is, is, is largely to credit for why they're succeeding the way they are. Now, of course, I'm not going to you know, completely rule out the fact that they do have some really premium top quality young talent in this team, mm-hmm. um, which, which leads me to my next part is that, you know, we know that there are one of the younger squads in Europe. They've had this sort of emphasis on the market and acquiring these young players. And, you know, you can point to that sort of, profile of the squad it's never easy to get young players to perform at this level this quickly and to compete for things right it usually takes a lot of time years at the club and a little bit of a blend between youth and and veteranship on the squad but overall as you mentioned you got guys like Benacer you got guys like uh, Teo Hernandez you guys got like, like Rafael Leal Romagnoli who's in my opinion now feels like a veteran because he's been at the club so long but generally speaking the youth mold of this squad and the youth makeup of this squad is I find a strength of them, right? Because I think there's a lot of expectation that comes with someone who's maybe, let's say four to five to six years under his belt, makes a big transfer, is getting paid a ton of money after being a young promising player. And then for some reason they struggle to perform and acclimate. We see it time and time again, right? You know, one example would be for Federico Bernadeschi, who you know, was great at Fiorentina was a key player for them. Mm-hmm. And then he goes to U of A for a big fee and he's not quite the same player. He can't quite translate that over. So mm-hmm. I think the fact that there's so much uncertainty and perhaps a lot more on the table for these, these younger players to um, grow into and to become is something that where they're able to take the field and it's like, they got nothing to lose. They have a little bit less pressure on them in my opinion, versus the established veteran who's being asked to be, the same player he was previously score the goals, get the assists, play exceptionally well week in and week out. So there's almost like this innocence to this young squad when you look yeah. at some of these players. So yeah, I want to jump in on this because this is a great, uh, a great moment to ask you a question about that. So you said yeah. that maybe these young players uh, have not much to lose because they just, I'm here. I'm just want to prove myself. I've uh, there's everything for me uh, to grab on the table. Like you were saying, but now, as Milan continue to stay on top of the table, will, is there a risk that their legs will shake? Is there a risk that they will choke? Because, oh, wow, now we have something to lose, if that makes sense, because we're sitting first. Do you think, would you expect that from these young players? Um, there is a possibility of that. I think that's a, great, that's a great question. That's a valid concern that anyone should have, right? I think, you know, the important thing for this when looking at this squad is that yes, while there's a lot of young talent in this team, that's really driving the bus here and, and why Milan are in the position they are. There's got to be elements of a veteran experience that can help you get you through those delicate phases that you're mentioning, right? When you're a team that's very young 
and you have a great start and everyone's saying, wow, can they actually win the title? Can they be the team that dethrones Juve? You need those veteran players to kind of know there's, there's more to it. There's a lot of work left to be done. We can't get ahead of ourselves. We got to stay calm. We got to stay relaxed in these, in these stages of the season and just keep our heads down. And I think that's what kind of probably leads me to my third strength with the squad. And you can make a case with, you know, a couple of players being grouped into this, but those elder statesmen, those guardian type, per, uh, you know, members at the squad, right. You know, guys like Maldini making decisions in the top, mm-hmm. you know, Ibrahimovic who knows what it takes to win at this club and knows what it takes to win at the highest level. And a guy like Pioli who, has some success in, in the past, but he like he almost falls into that same kind of category that I mentioned about the youth, right? He had really nothing to lose here because he was brought in and from the jump, everyone thinking, who the heck is this guy? Why is he being brought in? Those, the expectations were so low. And then what does he do? He, gets, he comes in here, he does really well. He exceeds expectations. He gets a new contract. And now they're in first. So like having those that sort of veteran personalities, I think is a really fundamental element to this squad as well and I think it's going to be a huge deciding factor in them maybe not winning the title because I think the title is still a very difficult thing for them to achieve I think they're going to go through phases just like everybody else does but to also stay on track to 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 meet their objective which in my opinion and I think the opinion of many is to finish top four get back into the Champions League which I think all things considered would be a wonderful feat for this team considering they again they are very young they do have Pioli who came in and you know, they haven't been in the Champions League, what, since 2013, 2014. Wow. That's, that's absolutely. Yeah, it's crazy to say that. It's crazy to say that. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think, I think maybe the last year in Champions League for AC Milan was the one time, uh, was that year when they got knocked out by Barcelona? Uh, no, it was actually the year after that. It was, um, they, they, I know what you're talking about. They had yeah. the, the two legs where they won the first game 2-0. Yeah, Muntari uh, and... Uh, Muntari and... Um, Sharawi, I think. Muntari and Boateng, I think. And Boateng, okay. And then the second leg was the Neon post. But they wound up making the Champions League next year, and I think that was Kaká's final year. They got knocked out by Atletico Madrid in the round of 16, I believe. Uh, okay, 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 absolutely. But yeah, but, yeah, but around the same players, mm-hmm. you know, Ibrahimovic, Thiago Silva, all the, you know, old guard all left. So that was kind of like that... Of, and you can really kind of see how far that they've they've come since as far as you know wow it's been seven eight years like it's it's time you know that they, they mm-hmm. got to get back there because the champions league just it doesn't feel right without them and because milan have uh recorded what was it, like a what is it a 23 game streak without losing since since the lockdown mm-hmm. uh how how much do you think that the fact that they're playing without fans has affected the performances of these young players? Is it less pressure? You know, an empty San Siro is not as frightening as a San Siro with fans in a club, like you say, where uh, you have to win, but winning hasn't uh, has become a, a habit that Milan had lost. So uh, in a team with that much expectation, how do you think that the fact that they're playing without fans has helped this young side? Well, it's really hard to say, right? Because I think, you know, look, we go back to around this time last year, and I think they were, you know, I don't don't quote me on this, but they were taking, I think, a 5-0 beating to Atalanta, right? And Atalanta, no disrespect to them. They they are a wonderful team. They play really well, really wonderful football. But that's a heavy defeat to take to Atalanta, who who don't have a fraction of your wage bill, a fraction of your sort of success historically. And for you to be taking heavy defeats like that, that's glaring to see how different things are right now. Now, it's hard to really say, right, how much the crowd, because the crowd could be something that really feeds and motivates young players. Wow, I'm playing it for the San Siro. This is like, I, I dreamt of this. Mm-hmm. And a lot of players rise to the occasion and they really play well to that. Others, it's a little bit of a different case because, you know, if you're, you, you dribble too much and you lose the ball, you don't run back, you're going to feel it from the fans. And we all know how much the Curva Suid is very vocal, right? They're probably one of the most passionate you know, groups that I've seen. And I know they're they're because they love their club so much and they expect more. So I, I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see not only just with Milan and, and Serie A, but in general, how some of these teams react to, you know, the fans coming back and that element, because right now it's almost like you're playing home and away games, but there's no sort of home field advantage. And, a lot of times it happens is even Juve is a perfect example of that who historically really since, you know, the, this past decade, 
they were dominant, so dominant and so feared at home that even if they were down to two goals or three goals in a Champions League match over two legs, they can reverse those. And I think that's really something that I'm focused on. I Listen, if we want to see fans back, of course we do. <laughs> but if that's something that's going to maybe spook some of these younger players at Milan, then maybe, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and just to give uh, an anecdote of that kind of tells how emotional, emotional mm -hmm. fans are in Italy. This past weekend, after Fiorentina lost yet another game, the fans, they just uh, put a banner uh, outside of uh, the Stadio Artemio Franchi, where Fiorentina plays mm -hmm. uh, their home game, saying, uh, svegliatevi tutti, you all wake up. So, like, there is pressure, absolutely, like you're mm -hmm. saying, like, uh, San Siro, uh, I can only imagine how, how, hard, how, you know, how high the pressure is to perform there. But uh, let me go back to my, to my point. I'm really curious about what you have to say uh, uh, for Milan's weakness or weaknesses, if you were able to find more than one. Sure. Um, I think one that a lot of people are going to look at is, um, you know, in these matches where Ibrahimovic isn't playing or, you know, Simon Kajer is not playing, are they too dependent on Ibrahimovic, right? Because I think it's only natural for, and this is something I was thinking of yesterday, you know, it's only natural for teams to depend on their star players, right? You know, we see with Juve, not saying they're strictly Ronaldo dependent, but I think that you look at the, the performances they've had without him and the Crotone draw, the Elas Verona draw, like there's just something missing, even though they have the name, you know, Chiesa, Kulisevsky, they have the defensive players, they have the goalkeeper, they have more than enough to play above what they're playing right now. But they always seem to be looking towards Ronaldo in those moments to score the goals, right? And we, and we saw that on the weekend, where they weren't mm -hmm. incredibly overtaking Genoa, but two penalties from Ronaldo, and it seems to me it's like the same sort of element you can make a case for goes over to Ibrahimovic with Milan, where... We know the impact he's had. We know how the younger players look to him. And when you take him out of the equation and you have a guy like Rebic in there who's just not a natural striker, they, a lot of the players look around and they kind of seem to lose sight of where they're supposed to be at times. And, okay, who am I supposed to play this to? Who am I Because beyond being just a player and a producer that Ibrahimovic is, he's almost like a coach on the field. He's always pointing things out. He's always asking for players to over the top or, you know, you know like way that, yeah, he's always very animated and very vocal um, as a striker. So to have that presence come, taken out of the equation is a little frightening. I think that's something that, in my opinion, that I think Milan had to really look hard at in January to at least bolster because when you take out those players in the back or in the midfield, they seem to kind of lose a little bit as far as direction. Um, I'm not going to say that they're completely dependent on Ibrahimovic mm -hmm. to get results because on the weekend, they, they look pretty good. And I think they should have beaten Parma if one or two of those crossbar shots goes the right way for them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think it's, it's not really too surprising to see in some of these games where when he's out, something's not quite there as far as the fear that the other team sees in this team. And you mentioned Ante Rabic not being uh, a pure center forward. And uh, looking at yesterday game, I remember Stefano Pioli uh, giving directions to Rabic, telling him, hey, do not always attack the depth because Rabic likes to, uh, to make that run behind the defender's back. He told him, sometimes just stay here, stay there, and let your teammates use you as a bouncer, right? Which Ibrahimovic does perfectly. So absolutely, um, Milan... And that leads me into another question I have for you. So, uh, Ibrahimovic, you know, we know he's out for injury. He's not getting any younger. He's a pure center forward that, um, like no other right now in, on Milan's roster. So, do you think that Milan are thinking of a replacement? And should we expect one already in the January transfer window? Um, I think any good management, any successful club is very proactive. They prepare well. Um, and I think Milan should be no different in this situation. I think they brought back Ibrahimovic for six months and then they got that option to extend for another year, which we're seeing right now. And obviously it's something that they can revisit in the summer and Ibrahimovic can very well, you know, go on for another year and take it year by year because I think he obviously still has plenty to offer and he loves Milan quite a lot. 
but I think it would be foolish for Paolo Maldini and uh, Mazzara and Moncada, the, the guys that are making those decisions as far as the transfers go mm-hmm. and scouting and really finding the, the next guy that can succeed him because, you know, we're not so far removed from the striker curse, right? All these players coming in and out, not being able to produce and, the best striker Milan have had, this is funny, the best striker that Milan have had since Ibrahimovic has been Ibrahimovic by a landslide, right? So, like, there's that gap there where, you know, you're looking at who the next guy is because, to your point, he's not getting any younger. And you need to be in those positions where if he does go out for a game or two where he does need just a breather due to natural fatigue, can that next guy come in and more or less keep that sort of same system and style of play going? And I think it's also one of the things that I want to see with this team. And as far as, you know, addressing this area is if they can bring someone in who's young, but ready to explode or burst out, have him a year, a year or two, however long Ibrahimovic is willing to go to train under him. Cause I think that's such a valuable thing to have at any club. I think there's a lot of benefits from, you know, the Juve players training under Ronaldo, you know, his preparation, his diet, his you know, attention to detail on a day-to-day basis and what makes him so great and so prolific. So the couple of the names that I would obviously like to see Milan attack, uh, whether it be January, it looks a little bit more tougher in January because deals are just tougher to, to pull off. And mm-hmm. we're also in the middle of a pandemic. So the money may not be quite, you know, right, quite there at the moment. But Gianluca Scamacca, on, um, I could be pronouncing that wrong, so I apologize. But uh, at Genoa, he mm-hmm. looks like a really, really class talent. Uh, Andrea Bellotti is one who's been linked to Milan in the past. Mm-hmm. He's got a really good connection relationship with Donnarumma. Uh, and he's just kind of has the, those same sort of qualities you look for, right? He could, they can run, they're back to goal. They're not sort of a poacher type striker, which I would like someone who's as prolific as Mario Riccardi, but you know, that, that was something that's come up in, in, in rumors as well, that he wants to come really? back to Italy. Yeah. I, I saw something like that. I think from his, his, you know, Wanda Nata, his agent, his wife, she's very, I find manipulative as far as the media goes. <laughs> So it wouldn't stun me if something gets drummed up and she tries to make that sort of thing happen. For me, don't touch him. The, uh, the headlines, you have his limitations <laughs> as a striker. So I, in short, I think they do need to address the area. Um, they do need to get someone who is more of that modern cut striker who can run off the ball, run off the shoulder, can link play, can do a little bit more than just get the ball, turn, and, and fire into the net. So I think that should be a focus for this team. And I suspect it's going to be someone of that younger profile because I think that's mm-hmm. just kind of what Gazidis and, and Milan management are looking for. Well, Icardi does have a nice house overlooking San Siro in Milan. <laughs> uh, but Chris, do you have any potential candidates for, uh, uh, for replacing Ibra or for being a substitute to Ibra, which coming from the Premier League maybe? Yeah, it was the answer was simple until two weeks ago. Giroud, what I felt would have been a great fit. Unfortunately, when you score five goals, uh, your your manage in one week, your manager is not going to cut you loose quite <laughs> yet. And in fact, yeah, they sit down, <laughs> Abraham. But I've been talking for months how Giroud would be a perfect um, fit for that. Now, of mm-hmm. course, Giroud wants playing time, so. Ibra is not going to be too wild about that. And I don't know mm-hmm. how it makes sense to have two of those guys up high, but I got to tell you, it's going to be hard to find an all around um, striker like Ibra. It's just, they don't make them like that anymore. Right. I mean, it's almost mm-hmm. considered old school to the point where it's really effective in this new style of play. Right. Just, I want strikers that want to, that can get behind the defenders or I want strikers that can dribble through the middle to get up there. That's the new offensive model now. And what, but what's working is, is Giroud, um, you know, Ronaldo, uh, uh, Ibra, uh, Lukaku, right? I mean, uh, that's. Cavani, that's something with, like that too. Yeah, yeah. And I just, it's, it's unfortunate. And I think you're right, Matt they're not enough dollars or lira or euros in January, I don't think. And if you look at how much City A teams bought in the last transfer window, uh, AC Milan is going to have to sell somebody to, uh, to be able to finance that. And I hope they get Ibra for, for a couple million more. And, and, you know, he puts on his braces and what I mean, (laughs) knee braces and gets out there and they roll them out, you know, roll them out on a wheelchair and get them out on the field. 
Um, so that's going to be really interesting because there's that very front piece. And then my next question to you, Matt, is mm -hmm. the very, very end, which is Donnarumma, who's reportedly wants to, his, his salary to go up 50% and uh, his agent's probably going to want another 10 or 15 million in transfer fees. And I just don't know if that's going to happen. What's, what's your take on that? It's a very complex one, right? Because I think, you know, at the time of what was it, 2017, I recall, is when the whole situation went down where AC Milan released a statement saying that Donnarumma wasn't going to extend another year. And at that point, you know, everyone was willing to just cast this guy aside and just saying, just get rid of him at this point. You mm -hmm. know, never the whole, you know, the famous uh, at the Euros where people were throwing dollars at him and calling him Dollarumma. And that's kind of what the perception was at that time, right? He signed another contract, he extended, he kind of you know, was able to bridge that gap and, and make that relationship work with the fans. And it feels like a lot of people have gotten because it's easy, it's easy to get over those things and to have the fans forget that when you're playing like he's playing, right? And not many people can play to his level at his age. I don't think anybody is playing to his you know, performance level at 21, right? So it's unheard of to, you know, to have a kid in his position who – is the focal is one of the focal points of the project um, is a pillar of that team is a commanding presence is so influential to having some of these defenders play well, because it's, it's all, you know, you would, you can attest to it. You know, if you have a, a commanding presence and goal, those defenders feel like they can look over their shoulder and they have someone who's going to cover them. When you have a guy like Kepa for Chelsea, for instance, you see the kind of reaction, the trickle down effect it has on the, mm -hmm. on the defensive line. So, it's hard. I think that Milan have done a really good job of structuring their restructuring their wage bill and getting rid of a lot of the dead weight to make certain exceptions like they saw with Ibrahim, right? Because I think that was a big conversation that a lot of people are having was we're going to tie up this much money for one player who's 39 years old. It kind of goes against our model. But I think if you're looking at Donnarumma, he kind of fits everything you want, right? He's a, he would be an emblem, uh, emblem player for you along with Romagnoli. He's very young and if you pay him now, you're not paying a lot of players high wages on this team. You pay him now, he knows that if he's getting, he's going to get the opportunity to potentially play in the Champions League if Milan can make that happen, his future move will always be there. If he wants to go and play to Real Madrid or a PSG, I don't think many Milan fans are going to, you know, hit at him for that. Now, mm -hmm. I think if Milan come up short in the Champions League or in their Champions League chase, and, or if they just get in and then he leaves – it'll certainly leave a sour taste in the mouths of the fans because we finally got there, right? Now you're leaving. It's an interesting one. It's, it's always an interesting one when Raiola is the one that's, you know, yep. making, making things happen and pulling the strings. So let's keep an eye out on it. But I think that's a, a big reason why the negotiations for Hakon are very key here. And I, one reason why I think that it wouldn't surprise me if he did leave because I think he's a player you like, Hakon. But if it's going to compromise you keeping a Romagnoli for another couple of years and paying Donnarumma to be a key player and maybe Ibrahimovic, Ibrahimovic for another year, then you maybe don't go that route. You mentioned Hakan Chalanoglu. Uh, he grew so much over the past, in 2020, yeah. over the past year. The way he strikes the ball is just phenomenal. Every corner kick, uh, he basically hits this curved ball uh, from the left side. Um, and an in-swinger, and it looks like he can score any time because he has this this pace on uh, on his uh, on his deliveries that is just amazing. And uh, as a midfielder, he has almost a hundred goals in his career. That's a lot for a midfielder. That's a lot. That's a lot. And sp because you spoke about potential rumors of Icardi going back to uh, uh, the other side of Milan, there was also rumors about uh, Chalanoglu going to Inter. I don't know if you heard that. Uh, I did, yeah. yeah, yeah. Potential swap with uh, Christian Eriksen. I don't know. How would you feel about that? Well, it's funny, too, because I like Eriksen quite a bit, and I actually liked him years ago when Milan were first to him when he was at Ajax. I think mm. this was somewhere around 2011, 2012, and I think at that point in time, it was between um, Milan and Tottenham for him. And I think Milan wound up going with Boateng at the time. And Erickson went to Tottenham and he was a, was a phenomenal player for them. So I've always would have like kind of drew up the idea. It was almost Eric, like Erickson and Jekyll were the two guys that I felt like the ones that got away from Milan because like Jekyll was between City and Milan. 
from going from Wolfsburg, and then he went to City, and he had a pretty good career there. He scored 50-plus goals in, I think, three top leagues. And then you look at Ericsson, and I look at him as a player, and I'm like, I feel like this, was, this would be a guy we would need. If we can't extend Hakan, then maybe there is a possibility for a swap. Now, the swap deals don't really happen with rivals. We don't really see it that often. Mm-hmm. But I know for a fact we had the deal a couple, you know, a couple of years ago or about a handful of years ago when it was Pazzini and Cassano switching, switching clubs, mm-hmm. right? So it's possible if Milan are saying, hey, look, we don't want to give Hakan the money. We want a guy like Ericsson. He'll play. He'll be happy. He won't have to move, right, because he's already there. And then you guys can have Hakan, who's a younger player. I just think the one thing that sours me a little bit on the Hakan situation is that they brought him in at a young age. And if he was to leave in a situation, if assuming there is no swap deal for free, mm-hmm. what well, kind of goes against the very model that Milan have been looking for, right? Buy young, develop, and then sell higher for profit. So to see a guy like Hakan at the ripe age of 25, 26, 27, leave without you getting a fee, that would sit the right sit right with me. I understand the details behind wages and, and all these things. It just would be a little bit difficult for me, difficult for me to stomach. However, it's obvious that Ericsson doesn't fit in at Inter. He's not getting the reps. I think he still has a lot to offer if he does get opportunity. And you could even see some of the quotes from Conte and in the media. It almost looks like Ericsson's kind of had it. He's he's done. He's not getting the he's not getting the minutes, and they're very few and far between. They're usually five or six at the end of the game. So he certainly needs a change. Now, whether a swap deal could happen in January, I don't know. But I think it's worth pointing out that I think given the current climate, the financial climate of the game, swap deals are, will, could be more prevalent. You know, hmm. we saw it with Juve and Barcelona, with Arthur and Pjanic. So it is a possibility. Um, I like Ericsson as a player. I just think it would be really difficult for me as a Milan fan, and I think Milan fans in general, to kind of rationalize getting rid of a key player right now who's been one of the hotter players for you in 2020, midstream through the middle of the season for Ericsson, who's out of form. That would be a very big risk, given that you are in position to, right now, I think, stand, potentially win a title, and at the very minimum, hopefully finish top four. That's something that, if it doesn't go the right way, that could be leading to some sackings, because that's, that would be a big risk there. Yeah, I, I tell you, I, I think that's the risk reward isn't there. I mean, I think Erickson, I enjoyed him so much as a player years ago. I just, mm-hmm. you know, as as we've seen with Inter, just adjusting, moving to one place. I mean, he basically sat on the shelf for a year in Tottenham, but while they were trying, mm-hmm. things weren't worrying, working out on the move. But I think, Matt, I do think your point about loans are going to be what the January transfer window is going to be. Yeah. About. Loan with and options and yeah. And loans of money. Be, and yeah. Yeah. And it's, and quite honestly, the same thing for the summer too, because I don't know if, if we're going to kind of get past COVID in time for, for next year's no. either. And, and there's just, people have to repair their balance sheets. And to me, you know, I think Danielle alluded this to this earlier. It kind of makes sense to pay up a little extra for your existing players right now keep yeah. them happy and not pay transfer fees and they don't need to pay transfer fees because no one else is in the big five. Right. Right. Uh, so I just, I don't see anybody splashing any big cash in January. It's going to be loans and loans are tough because it's, it's got to be two ways with the players rather than I have the cash. I want that player. Right. Right. So, yeah, like happy. I think you're going to see a lot of similar, similarly structured deals to what we saw with, um, you know, Tonali which I think was a, a wonderful mm. you know, deal as far as the players concerned and the talent that Milan were getting, but also the way the money was packaged and kind of it was structured for, for Brescia to get the value for their player, right? Money over a couple payments. And I think that was one of the biggest things that I think potentially led to the collapsing of you know, Jadon Sancho going to Man United, right? I think they wanted all their money right up front. And I understand that. But, you know, now look at Sancho. Look at the fallout of that. So there's a risk reward on the selling side too, right? If you've got a premium asset and a top player, well, do you wait around and you hope that he doesn't get distracted by all the, all the, the media buzz surrounding a move? Or do you say, hey, look, we have to understand the situation and the climate we're in. Let's try and get him at our peak value and move on and continue to grow because a team like Dortmund, you know, they were only able to offer 20 to 25 from what I was reading to keep Hakimi. And Hakimi was a, a fantastic player for them. And then in comes Inter and they offer 40, 45. So, 
it's it's interesting. I think, you know, that's also the key. It's one thing to scout the players and to keep that sort of approach going, but it's another to, to your point, um, have the money in a position where you're healthy financially because there's going to be a lot of knee-jerk reactions to this, right? Because there's a lot of teams that are overachieving. I mean, I saw a post today of the top five, the, the leaders in the top five leagues, and it's not what you expected. So, you know, there's some of these even big teams are not even able to spend. Mm-hmm. Barcelona are in a really bad spot. Real Madrid didn't spend last summer. They're trying to move money around. So it's really not just affecting the smaller clubs or the clubs that are more money strapped. But top to bottom, there's a lot of huge reaction to this. So I agree. I think loans are going to be a really fundamental part of January and the summer. Well, this transfer market decision will uh, be in the hands of a similar management. So, uh, Matt, why don't you help us see who is behind this AC Milan ownership and management? We know that the club is owned by Elliott Management Corporation, an American investment management firm. The founder is Paul Singer. We have AC Milan chairman Paolo Scaroni, the technical director Paolo Maldini. But there's a lot of Paul and Paolo, by the way, I just realized. Uh, <laughs> but why don't you help us see who is playing the biggest role in building this new brand of AC Milan? Sure. I think it's um, obviously there's been so much restructuring at the top um, since the days of Berlusconi. And even before then, you know, um, you know, with guys as far as the directors and making decisions is concerned. Right. You know, we are so used to seeing Galliani, Ariado, Breda and Berlusconi. Those were like the mm-hmm. three pillars of the guys at the top that were so you know, fundamental in Milan having their, their previous reign of success. And then you had Mirabelli and Fassone who spent through money at everybody and, obviously that was a mess, right? And the whole, you know, Chinese takeover. So now I think it's, it feels a little bit more normal, more structured, more, mm-hmm. everyone kind of knows what their role is as far as um, at the club goes. Um, I think it was very important that Paolo Madini stayed. I know there was a lot of reaction or potential reaction to Ralph Ragnar coming in and how he was going to try and run the club as more of like a, you know, I, I'm in charge of transfers. I'm in charge of, you know, the players on the field. And I think that model is quite difficult, in my opinion, to pull off at a big club. It's one thing to do it at one club. It's another at, at a club like Milan where the pressure is as high as it can possibly be to get back to previous heights. But you know, you, between Paolo Maldini, between Gazidis, um, who's done really well on the commercial mm-hmm. side of things, I know that was a big talking point too. I always kind of laugh at Arsenal fans too because they thought that once <laughs> they got rid of Gazidis, all their problems were going to go away. And now obviously we're seeing what's happening with them. But and then you have Moncada, who, who has ties to Monaco. We all know the success he had in previous years, scouting players, a lot of young talent across um, French football. So you're seeing a little bit of a blend here. It's not just strictly, well, we're getting all Italian guys, and that's the mindset we want. I think you're getting a lot of different minds um, involved in the brain trust and decision-making. And I think it's one of those things that's really worked to the benefit of Milan in the sense that one guy may see something in a player that the other one doesn't or the scout doesn't. And I thought the one biggest thing that was telling for me what I read from Paolo Maldini was the trust they have in scouting. I think that was such a huge element Mm -hmm. that Milan lacked in previous years and why they struggled quite a bit was, Mm -hmm. well, we're not going to spend, we can't get the 40 to 50 to 60 million players. We can't pay them high wages. So we got to get back to a position where we can get to talent before the other clubs can. And I think that's really been a key here, key element here. And maybe, it's not so much focused on because everyone's looking at Maldini, 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 because he's the club legend and he's kind of at the forefront with as far as, you know, pushing the button on transfers, but scouting players, the scouting team's done exceptionally well. And I thought, I think Mancata, um, you're going to start to see a lot more of his impact as far as the transfer policy is going moving forward. Yeah. And about this model of, of scouting intelligently and all around Europe, who would you say is the club that is currently doing the, the best at that who's the best at that at the moment in Europe if you were to point to one that's tough I mean you can point to plenty I mean yeah. Leipzig does a really good job I think that whole RB model they just kind of players shuffle within and out of that network um Borussia Dortmund they always seem to be able to replace their star players that they sell you know for instance you know we were on our podcast in previous weeks we were drumming up the idea of well if they sell Holland is Marcus Thuram the guy they bring in right both players are me and Raiola represented the round looks like a really class striker. So, you know, those two, those clubs specifically tend to do really well as far as replacing and replenishing their squad to be competitive year in and year out. But I even think Liverpool, you know, it's for a club to have the money they do in the Premier League, mm. to have the success they've had, 
it's one thing to just throw money at the big players and you win. But I think they've done really well scouting players. Their academy is really well stocked. And they have such a big emphasis on the analytics side of things. And I think that's what you're starting to see with a lot of other clubs and, and that go with that sort of means to competition where you can't spend. Okay, so what's next? We got to look at, you know, what elements of a player can we get in here? And I think you saw a little bit of that here with some of the later or most recent additions that Milan brought in, specifically uh, Salamakers, right? Largely unknown player from Anderlecht. I think he was a Belgian U21 player at best. They bring him in for very cheap, and now he kind of was has become a starter for them. Mm -hmm. That's what you want, right? Even Benacer, you know. So you can lump these clubs in here, but it's it's really hard to say, you know, who is the best. I think you would probably have to go to a club like Leipzig because I think they just do really well of, you know, replacing guys year in and year out, you know, despite sort of the attraction that they get as you know a team that does a lot with as little as some of the other clubs. Yeah, I think I think my take on it is. I think the Galactico model is dead, right? I mean, we're seeing the last vestiges of the Galacticos spend big monies on players in their prime. And then for years you've had this, okay, let's buy uh, younger, cheaper talent, take our risks, mm -hmm. right? Right. But, but no, don't spend a lot of money. And then you've mm -hmm. got someone like Liverpool, which is, well, we're going to go young, but we also have some money too, right? right. So, and that's where I think, AC Milan, uh, I don't think they're that the we've got cash model per no. se, but they have the prospect of moving into that position. Right. While that I still think the Juve's, the Real Madrid's of the world, the Barca's, you know, Barca was a internal La Masia, then it went to Galactico and it's been a freaking disaster for the last yeah. five years, the transfer. And, and, you know, Arsenal was going chasing big dollars, big dollar signings as well. And it's blowing up. And so I'm going to be real interested to see is what is that next generation analytics inspired scouting plus analytics work well, plus dollars, right? There's, there's, there's the most, the biggest thing too, and the most fearful thing that any club should have if you're one of their competitors is a team that has money and that is smart with their money. Yeah. Right, because we've mm -hmm. seen with Milan, you know, everyone was like, they, we, they need money. They, are, they you know, Berlusconi's not spending. They were going after free transfers. Okay, so then Leong Hong and the Chinese Chinese uh, ownership came in, and they spent two hundred million plus in one summer on a half a dozen players or a full dozen players, and I think only three remain at the club: Kessier, Hakan, and uh, Antonio Donnarumma, who's a third string mm -hmm. goalkeeper. So it puts into perspective that it's. You, you need to have money, yes, but people who are making decisions with that money have to be intelligent and, and a little more meticulous in their process of how they spend it. And that, that made me laugh because Gagliani was called the paramet parametro zero guy, which means just free transfer because he would go yeah. after all the, all the players that had, uh, were uh, at the end of their contract and he would just uh, bring them to AC Milan. Today on Monday, there was a draw for both uh, the Champions League round of 16 and the Europa League round of 32. Milan was drawn against Red Star, the, the Belgrade-based club. Matt, um, honestly, I haven't yet looked into the, this club, but besides the, the threat that they could pose to AC Milan, I want to ask you, how, do you think, uh, how much do you think that AC Milan are invested into getting to the final of the Europa League? Um, I would say moderately. Uh, I, I know there's been some mixed of feelings and mixed opinions on the Europa League because it seems as though that um, a lo the longer a lot of these clubs tend to go into this tournament, the more of a wearing effect and negative effect it has on it. I mean, if you're a club that is really well equipped and just kind of had a bad draw in the Champions League or maybe just had some struggles in the group stage and you find yourself in the Europa League, like perfect example would be like the Sevillas of the world or the Atletico Madrid's of the world who have made mm -hmm. it into this competition and then they've won it. I think if you're a team that's really well equipped to make a long run and you have the depth options, then it becomes a real legitimate focus for you. But I think if you're Milan, I don't necessarily rule it out to win this because I think they have a good squad that, you know, if they're able to navigate the tournament, navigate the entire season and they're healthy, then of course you're going to go for it. But the way we see the seasons right now, the way we see how condensed the schedule is with the whole you know, COVID involved, it's hard for me to want to risk 
from a Milan fan perspective, mm -hmm. key players in this tournament ahead of a, a key game that, you know, you need every single point in the, in, in the Serie A to get to where you want to be in the Champions League. So to prioritize the Europa League that may infringe or compromise on what your main objective is in getting back into the Champions League seems to me that it's pretty counterproductive. Now, I will say this, you know, as the tournament progresses, if Milan find themselves you know, getting past the stage and they're in the round of 16 and, hey, look, we have a pretty favorable draw here with mm -hmm. our, our, our road to the final is doable. Then, yes, I think obviously, you know, Milan are a team that, you know, has a great you know, pedigree historically um, in European competition. So you don't want to completely discredit and disregard the tournament. But for what I'm seeing already with the season and, and not just a Milan issue, but just in general in, in world football, it's the teams that are going to have the most depth that are able, in my opinion, going to be able to get the furthest in this competition. It may not so much be necessarily on the quality. I think if you have a team that has those depth options, you have multiple strikers, you have, you know, stacked midfield players and you just have a little bit of luck go your way, then I think you'll find yourself in the final. From a Milan fan's perspective, I think the priority has to be the, the Serie A. If, I don't think anyone's going to be, you know, uh, crying over, you know, uh, around the 16 exit in the Europa League. Obviously, you want to win. That's the goal, to win every sort of game you can. But if the trade-off is, hey, we're going to be balancing the round of 16, but we're going to finish top four or win a title, Milan fans are taking that 10 out of 10 times. So if I understand this correctly, you think that Pioli will keep doing basically what he has been doing so far, which is keeping maybe five elevens or six elevens of the their starting squad in the Europa League, right? Because so far we have seen only like a partial rotation of uh, within the, the squad. I mean, I think it's, it's – you saw with some of these games and the group stage is a really hard indicator to go by because, you know, even the last game against Sparta Prague, I mean, you had Daniel Maldini, you had Pierre mm -hmm. Kalulu, you had Jens Peter Hauger starting. So you had a lot of rotation options, Tata Rusanu. So it was – it's, in my opinion, easier to rotate in the group stage, but I don't think it's going to be the truest indicator of how Pioli will go forward. I think it's just a matter of what games on the calendar before and after the Europa League game. If mm -hmm. you have a Europa League game midweek and then you're looking at a pivotal game against Inter, Napoli, Juve, Atalanta, Lazio, Roma, the priority has to be that game. I'm not saying you're not going to try and show up and put a good lineup out there, but are you going to risk Ibrahimovic for 90? Are you going to risk the same squad in that game that you need your, your, your best for the game on the weekend? I don't know. That's why I'm not a coach. That's why Pioli has a tough task at hand to kind of navigate the tournament in a way that doesn't compromise on what the actually actual main objective is in my opinion by the way red star might not be a major club today in europe but uh 30 35 years ago they used to be when the when they used to face uh arrigo sakis ac milan that was a big time mm -hmm. club i remember uh my parents talking about it talking about uh european's cup finals with uh red star against uh, against ac milan Chris, how do you see this draw? Well, I don't know if I have as much commentary on the draw. I, I will say that uh, if, if AC Milan advances um, past the round of 32, uh, that's a half a million euros. Round of 16 is 1.1. Quarterfinals is 1.5. Winning those three games basically pays for Donnarumma's salary increase. Yeah. Right? yeah. So that's it. <laughs> you run the you run the gamut. Uh, that's going to be another um, I don't know, 15 million euros, uh, 18 million euros. And I got to tell you, back in the old days, people wouldn't pick up bother to pick up the change on the ground on this. <laughs> But in this day and era, I just wonder. And I don't think it's the coaches that are going to be thinking in these terms. But I wonder if the general manager, top, yeah. and particularly with COVID and wanting to lay people off, it maybe makes sense to hey, let's maybe a little subtle to the coach. We, we need to win some games here in Europa. So, so it's yeah. an extraordinary time. It's just the economics are so much more pronounced now than ever before, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great point, too. And I, my, a friend of mine who's a Manchester United fan was showing me the, what they missed out on as far as the, 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 the revenue generated and the money generated from just strictly getting to the knockout stages versus bowing out in the, you know, the group stage. And obviously, we know that there's a difference between the Champions League and the Europa League, but money's money. And in this climate, I think if you're a club like Milan, who 
under you've been in a position where money is a little tight and you, you know they've had their experiences with financial fair play with uefa so yeah i absolutely agree with it i think that there's an opportunity for them to go through the tournament pick up some more cash that's going to help ease ease the 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 money they'll throw at donnarumma while also you know being able to kind of stay on course with their main objectives then of course you entertain it. i think it's still a little too early to kind of tell right now because i think even with their hearts being in on the Europa League, for some reason, these Italian teams have struggled in the Europa League. I know Inter made it to a final last year. I get it. But even the clubs like Napoli, even clubs like um, you know, you know, Roma, for instance, who have had pretty good squads, they seem to kind of slip up in their round of eight, round of 16, when they probably should win. And you know, that's going to be a challenge. Now, look, I think the Europa League, if you guys can correct me on this, um, that's one of the only trophies I don't think Milan have actually won on the European stage. So that's possibly a challenge and something that they want to kind of approach as well to see if they can maybe add that one to their uh, to their trophy cabinet at Casa Milan. Yeah, I feel like until maybe a couple of years ago, Europa League was a little disregarded uh, from yeah. Italian clubs. Um, well, Roma was paired with uh, with Braga and Napoli will will face Granada, but... I would like to spend a couple of words on the on the Champions League draw round of 16. Lazio was paired with uh, uh, Bayern Munich. Uh, Juventus got Porto, and Atalanta will play Real Madrid. Uh, obviously, on paper, Juventus have the easiest uh, draw. Who do you think guys have the best chance between Lazio and Atalanta against Bayern Munich and Real Madrid, respectively? Oof, um... I think Atalanta. Why? I mean, I know they're going. I, well, I know they're going through a little bit of a difficult phase now, um, with the rumors of uh, Papa Gomez and Gasparini having issues mm-hmm. with one another, and um, them not being quite as sharp as they were last year. I think they were a little bit more feared, a little bit more um, consistent last year as far as their play style goes, as far as the results they were getting, as far as scoring, which they were one of the highest scoring teams in in all of Europe last year. This year seems like a little bit of like a regression. They're coming back to the regressing to the mean here. But I will say this, you know, Real Madrid are, yes, they're not in as dire of a situation like we've seen with Barcelona. But I think at the same time, I think they've proven to be very beatable. This is a team that I think that has shown plenty of vulnerability. A team that, yes, can, can score goals, can wow you. They have the names on the team sheet. You know, Tony Cruz, Modric, uh, Karim Benzema, still a top, top striker. And we saw what he did um, in, in, in the Champions League so far. But I think Atalanta are a team where – in many ways, you know, they have nothing to lose. And this is going to be a challenge for them. Right? We're playing the mighty Real Madrid, a team that's the most successful on the European stage in the knockout round. Like, let's play our game. Let's, let's go after them. Let's leave it all out on the field. Whereas I think with, you know, Lazio and Bayern Munich, Lazio have already taken a step back this year. They're not as strong, in my opinion. I think they have underachieved. Um, and I just look at Bayern and Robert Lewandowski hasn't even – taken off in the Champions League yet, in my opinion. I think he's scoring goals. He's still playing well, but he hasn't hit like his stride yet in this competition, in my opinion. And we all know that Bayern Munich have this sort of pedigree um, coming off as treble winners where they're going to want to repeat. You know, we haven't seen many repeat winners in this tournament and they're built to win. I mean, top to bottom, Bayern Munich, I think are favorites in my opinion, if if I want to, you know, if I'm being honest. So I think out of those two ties, Mm -hmm. I think Atalanta has, the best chance to get past them. I don't like both of them moving on, in my opinion. I just think those two teams have are battle tested. What they maybe could lack in some form at times, or you know, maybe fatigue, or maybe they're they're slightly tired, or they're not playing their best football in that moment. I think over two legs, it's going to be really, really difficult to beat a team like Bayern Munich or a team like Real Madrid. I'm inclined to agree. You know, I, I think Lazio, their defense, you know, they're at a minus two goal differential in, mm-hmm. in Serie A, uh, which is really uh, where I think that um, uh, Bayern Munich's going to feast. You know, Lewandowski, <laughs> yeah. a week in defense is just, it's, it's the hurt locker as far as I'm concerned. I'm inclined to agree with you that Atalanta, if there's a time to beat Real Madrid, this is that time. Yeah. It still may it still may not happen though. Probably won't happen. And you like and they don't have the daunting task of having to travel to the Bernabeu with the fans. And you know, yeah. we talked about home field advantage, right? I know that's something that's kind of somewhat out of the equation here, but you got to feel that if Atalanta could find a way to kind of get through this little 
media scare they're having or media issue as far as what's going on with Papu and Gasparini and some of the players, we've seen what they're capable of. They're a team that doesn't really crumble as far as it goes against big teams. Like they can play their football still. So yeah. I like their chances if any of these teams were to move on. No question. I mean, I, I remember they beat Liverpool um, mm-hmm. uh, fairly recently. So on any given Sunday, to use an American football term, yeah. uh, Atalanta can beat anybody. The question yeah. is, can they string together four or five wins in a row to win a championship? Probably not realistic. But right. Right. That's it's going to make for some exciting football. And Absolutely. Matt, it goes both ways because Real Madrid are lucky too not to have to travel to La Dea to uh, uh, yeah. Atleti Azzurri Italia. It's a uh, small, it's, small, small city of Bergamo, but man, those 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 passionate fans, man. Yeah, absolutely. And what about what about Juventus? I would say that yes, obviously on paper they have the easiest of this uh, uh, of these draws. But the, the, do Juventus give you the sense of solidity, the sense of oh yeah, they're gonna just go through? Because to me, they're still uh, they haven't completely found their identity under Andrea Pirlo. Mm-hmm. We're seeing a lot of great things, but it's too sporadic still. It's not that consistency that, for instance. I could see with Massimiliano Allegri. What do you guys think about that? I, I agree. I, I, I think, you know, they've somewhat what we saw last year on the Barizzo, sorry. I think there's moments where they look pretty good throughout the course of a 90 minutes, um, but more on an individual basis. So, mm. for instance, like we saw last year where you'll have, wow, this is a full-on Ronaldo Dybala takeover. They're looking one-twos, they're back heels, they're scoring goals, assisting one another, you know, that's what I think carried them quite a bit last year to the title. And I think we're kind of seeing somewhat of a similar element this year with Ronaldo and not Dybala, but Alvaro Morata, right? Where he's back in quote unquote home, where he mm-hmm. enjoyed his time in, in Turin at, at Juve in his, in his first spell. And now you're seeing like the games where, oh, okay, you know, he looked pretty good and they're kind of slacking in other departments. Oh no, but Ronaldo scored three goals. He looked really good today. He looked like he was 25, 26 years old. So I think, Juve haven't gotten to that position of the season like they have in previous years where they start, they, they start a little slow. They get results. They, find their, they back themselves into results. Then they still find themselves, hey, look, they're still at the top of the table despite everything. Mm-hmm. January is going to be the telling part. That was the, the one focus I had um, in my podcast when I was talking to my colleagues. You know, amidst all their rough, their rough games to begin the season, let's see where they are in January because you look at the table right now, what are they, three, four points back of Milan? That's, uh, that's not a bad spot yeah. to be in. So mm-hmm. they haven't come close to playing their best football yet. They're finally getting guys back. You know, De Ligt, Demiral, Ronaldo. If, if Pirlo can find a way to get this team to play to their ability, then yes, they're still a team that you have to fear. Um, not to mention, of course, they have Ronaldo, Mr. Champions League himself. The fact that you have a player like that um, in the knockout stages of the tournament – I mean, he's carried Real Madrid plenty of times. He's carried Juve times. I mean, perfect example was when they were down, what, two goals to Atletico Madrid a couple of years ago. Everyone ruled them out. What is he? He gets a hat trick and turn, mm-hmm. and then they progress in the tournament. So you have to always respect that that is a real possibility. Now, I will say this. We saw last year where they played Lyon. They didn't get by Lyon. They struggled. You know, they could Sorry, sorry couldn't, he couldn't quite get over the hump. He couldn't quite get the players to buy into it. Aside from the performances on the field, I think the general feeling from this squad is that they are tight-knit. They know that they're going through a delicate phase. But from what I'm reading from some of the quotes, there's a stark contrast between how Pirlo is doing as a coach and what the players are buying into with him versus the experience they had with Maurizio Sarri. And for me, I kind of expected that. I'm not going to say I, it was a, you know, I predicted everything that was going to happen with Sarri and that that was going to be the season he had. But you and I know, we all know here that you know, Sarri's Napoli took three, four windows, three, four seasons to get to its peak where they were nearly champions of Italy. The squad that he had at Juve, the short time, the window that they had to win under him, the expectations, he wasn't the best fit for them. And I think given the climate that we had here, that's why you're seeing Pirlo and not some very expensive manager in the position. Having said that, I think that in a, in a tournament like this, I think they'll get by Porto. And if they can kind of run into some hot form, 
then you never can quite rule out Juve because I think they still have plenty of quality in that team that hasn't quite played to its expectations. And I think that's something that you have to still fear as an opponent. Yeah, and failing to win the Champions League for Sarri cost him the job. But like you said, I don't feel it would cost Pirlo the job if he, uh, if he does fail to win the Champions League because, uh, like you said, players Ronaldo as well are, are just spending great words for him as a coach. And I guess there is a general understanding that uh, the work will eventually pay off. But like you yeah. said, it looks like, oh, we're willing to give Pirlo time. But since the beginning of Sarri's era, era, I mean, it was a year, but since the beginning of Sarri's time as a coach, it looked like they were not willing to give him that time. Well, the difference between Sarri and, and Pirlo too was with, with, with Sarri, he always seemed like an awkward fit. Right, you know, we, you know, this is not me trying to, you know, pick everything apart about the guy, but, you know, he, the tracksuit, you know, the cigarettes, the, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like that was, that's never really been the type of manager that Juve go for. They go from the guy with the suit, the that sort of Pirlo type, a guy that they go for. So, I don't know. I think there was kind of a okay. Well, we want to go against someone. Uh, 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 we want to go the opposite of Allegri because Allegri was so heavily criticized at the end of his career as Juve coach. Well, yeah, he won everything, but we want to play a different type of football. We don't want to be defensive. We don't want to play ugly football and, and where we just you know, you know, get by the skin of our teeth in, in, in certain matches. So they went, sorry, they wanted the sexy brand of football. They wanted what they saw in Napoli. Well, that takes multiple years and patience, something that Juve just doesn't have. So now they're trying to find that happy medium with Pirlo where he feels like the type of guy that Juve won as their coach, as far as this, his professionalism, as far as his experience, as far as his character. But they're going to have to accept the fact that he just got his license a handful of months ago. Yeah. <laughs> and he's coaching a team that is trying to win the Champions League with arguably the best player ever. So it's, it's yeah, it's got to be somewhat of a patience factor that, that comes into play with Pirlo. Um, it's going to be fascinating to see how he navigates through the rest of the season. And speaking of large contracts, uh, Sarri is still cashing in uh, Juventus' salary oh, yeah. of about six million a year. And he has said that he's not willing to terminate, you know, to come to an agreement about uh, terminating a, a deal with, yeah. with Juventus. And uh, partly, uh, uh, reportedly, it was also because it's also because Sarri doesn't like the way he was treated. So he's just not willing to, uh, to accept. Uh, an early termination of his contract. Yeah, that's, I think that's the funniest thing about the sport in general, right? I think you guys can also, you know, you know, would probably agree with me on this is that, you know, we always kind of go after the players or coaches where all they do is want money. They want to pay a raise. This is ridiculous. You know, we're getting, we're getting paid more than enough. And then when the player commits and signs like a big contract and everyone's happy and they're winning games. Oh, okay. But then when he, things go south and it's not going according to plan. Oh, he should cut ties. He shouldn't get his money. It's almost like you kind of want both, right? It's almost mm -hmm. like a very selfish thing that we have as fans because, and it's not even our money. Like we're looking at these guys and like, okay, you gave me, if I'm speaking from the perspective of salary, you gave me a contract to coach, you know, against your coach for you guys who was previously a rival of mine at Napoli. You're paying me well. Why should I just, okay, I'm just going to take the, 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 the severance or, you know, you know, you know, cancel my contract based on the way you treated me. Like, I, I just feel that it's, it's almost like a strange thing. And we're seeing it with the top players at certain clubs, right? Mazurozo. Fans are killing him. Some people are killing him. Oh, he's taking all the money. We're getting paid a ton of money. You gave it to him, mm -hmm. right? You, you gave it to him. Sometimes the contract thing is a really funny thing. And I, I don't know. I think, you know, even Spalletti was getting paid a ton of money at Inter, yeah. right? I think he, Milan wanted him as their coach last year when they sacked Gianpaolo. And he was getting paid four million. To, I think sit in his probably his villa in Tuscany. It's not that not a bad life, right? No. So With a glass of wine in his head in his hand for sure. Exactly. Uh, not a bad life at yeah. all. Well, guys, if you don't have, have anything else to add, I would just uh, thank Matt for uh, for his contribution. I really appreciate that. Thank, thank you, you for uh, helping us understand the dynamic of this Rossoneri squad and European football as a whole in this weird, unique season. We will continue to follow your, uh, your work, and please, uh, guys, do that as well. Matt, where, where can we find you on Twitter? Sure. Um, at Matt underscore Santangelo is my handle. 
Um, everything is in my bio that I'm working on or I have previously worked on or will be working on. Um, a lot of big focus is going into the podcast, which you alluded to at the top. We just won an award, so we appreciate everyone who um, showed up to vote um, online, uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, on all social platforms. And yeah, I'm looking forward to getting more episodes out to the end of the year, but I'm also looking toward uh, what's to come in 2021. So, so thank you guys for uh, supporting and thank you guys for having me on. Absolutely. Wish you a merry and safe Christmas. Thank you, Matt. Same to you guys. Thank you. Well, Chris, that was really a great conversation. Uh, precious insight from Matt. Really appreciate that. Chris, there's almost no time to metabolize what happened over the past Serie A weekend. The Serie A is back already with round 12, kicking off tomorrow on Tuesday with uh, the Inzaghi Derby as Benevento host Lazio. Chris, what are some of the games that you marked on the calendar for the next round? Well, the Juve Atalanta is going to be a whole lot of fun, uh, right? I mean, Juve is not firing on all cylinders. Atalanta is on some days it's smoking hot and on other days they're just not feeling the mojo. So I'm looking forward to see which teams show up after probably a leggy weekend and then a leggy Champions Week beforehand. How about you? What are you going to be looking for? Uh, I've got Inter Napoli for Wednesday at uh, uh, 2.45 Eastern time. Uh, it's just a big clash, right? Uh, Inter currently sitting second in the table. Napoli are, are third, so they're going to fight for uh, a spot as uh, a second, uh, maybe setting themselves as the, um, the contender for uh, uh, the chaser of AC Milan, at least for the... Um, for the Andata, which is the first, uh, the first round of games, the first uh, 19 round, 19 games of the seasons. Uh, also, I think that they're playing, uh, especially in Napoli, very uh, exciting, sparkling football. And I want to see how they, uh, how they, they're gonna perform against an Inter side that, like we said multiple times, are just the roster is just so deep, and they have that guy on top that Chris, you just. Uh, you just love, what's his name again? <laughs> Romelu Lukaku. Uh, it's it, it's going to be a great tactical matchup as well. You know, Napoli's going to want to bring it. It's going to be that that NBA-style offensive uh, <laughs> football. And um, Inter's going to be like, fine, take the ball, bring it. We're going to counter. And uh, it's just going to be a really exciting match. Yeah, absolutely. Great time uh, uh, on um, on Wednesday to just sit back and enjoy this midweek games. Luckily, we Good don't games. have any. Yeah. yeah, as fans, luckily we don't have breaks, right? Uh, either either <laughs> European Cups or uh, uh, a midweek Serie A round. Chris, we, they always feed us with games. What, what should we do but besides watching them and enjoying them? It's true. I mean, I'm, I've already talked to my physical therapist. I'm going to work on my neck and, <laughs> and back from sitting on the sofa so much. And uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. Yeah, what's all you're going to pull your hammies from uh, standing up uh, too fast? Jumping to, up. To run That's to the exactly. bathroom to get some snacks. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, that was a great culture conversation again. So we'll be back soon, guys, with another episode of the Total Football Analysis Serie A podcast. Ciao.